one. Well, stargazing in my backyard, and there's woo, there's a big bolide right there. That's that bright meteor there, burst in the scene in the twilight. Glad that everybody's with us today. I'm Mark Marquette, and we're so glad you're with us to stay star curious as the American Space Museum starts another week of video podcasts about space history, astronomy, and an occasional interview or two to, like we've got set up this week. So... Uh, out here in my backyard, and this weekend is the perfect Saturday night to lose some sleep and get some shooting stars under your belt. As the Perseid meteor shower, the most well-known meteor shower uh, every year, peaks on the night of Saturday, August 12th, the morning of the 13th. So if you lose some sleep, stay out in the backyard in a sleeping bag on the lawn chair, doze off and on you probably see six to 10 really bright meteors an hour. They're advertising 100 an hour, but that's if you're on top of a mountain and, and uh, in darkness out there in the West America, out there in the middle of nowhere. So reasonably, you're going to see, you know, four or five, maybe you might see 10 or 12 in an hour. You might see more than that, particularly when Sunday morning in the, uh, before sunrise, they seem to be a lot from the 3 a.m. to sunrise time. So if you're going to not lose much sleep, set your alarm for 2, 3 in the morning. If it's clear, go out in the backyard and you're going to see some shooting stars from the Perseid meteor shower. We're going to talk about that here in just a few more minutes. But on a sad note here at the American Space Museum, that is Ozzy Osbourne, Robert Ozzy Osbourne. He died in his sleep Sunday at age 72 and many of you know him as the self-proclaimed rocket hobo that was out at space view park for over four decades uh into from the shuttle era doing the all the crude launches to the unmanned launches and uh ozzy we're gonna miss you he was a great great volunteer at the american space museum we'll go over and see him at space view park uh, just three blocks from here, had his microphone, a boom box, and he'd be given the commentary in a 3-2-1 blast off that we have to laugh because very rarely did he hit the 3-2-1 at the, at the launch because of the time delay and the communications uh, that's being emanated. You can be off by three or four, even seven seconds. But once in a while you hit it, Ozzy. And, uh, but uh, we loved him as a great volunteer here involved with the museum way before I was. In fact, there's Ozzy about seven years ago wearing his Yuri's Night t-shirt with the phone in his hand because this gentleman is responsible for the 321 area code on our Space Coast. In 1999, on November 1st, the first phone call was made by the governor of the time, Jeb Bush, uh, to one the, this room here as NASA people uh, fielded the call with Ozzy there looking sharp in a suit. And um, uh, he was responsible as a um, ham radio operator up in uh, New York. His ham radio license, N4SCY. And he uh, promoted that in the early days of the U.S. Space Walk of Fame Foundation, our nonprofit institution. And uh, Ozzy, there he is at Space View Park. I love that picture of him, Marty. He just it, it, it moves me to see him like that. Uh, just so happy. Uh, a real eclectic type of guy. You'd say, Ozzy, how are you? And Ozzy would say, strange as usual. And uh, uh, he uh, was a veteran and um, just gave a lot there. He's wearing his Space Hipsters badge. Emily Carney was shocked to hear of his passing, and thank you for posting that on Space Hipsters there. What a great crowd out there at Space View Park, and there's Ozzy watching. Uh, he, he didn't know how many launches he saw, just hundreds and hundreds of them, and uh, we will have a tribute on Facebook uh, in a couple days, and we'll re replay one of Ozzy's appearances next week. I'm going to take a few days off, take a Friday and a Monday off, and we will uh, air one of Ozzy's programs 
on one of those days and we'll have that in advance there so went out and saw the rocket launch last night and put this little tribute together to ro to him and his rocket hobo patch that i'm proudly wearing on my hat here today fighting back a few tears because uh you know these kind of people really uh uh you don't know a lot about them in many ways and, and many of us didn't hear ozzy was a very private person and and um didn't have a big family down here or anything a bachelor uh, age 72 and uh, just to, to miss him going knowing I can go out there and take him a couple bottles of water he'd be sitting out there uh, in the heat waiting for a rocket to go off uh, at all hours he never missed any of them then he'd, he'd stand out there with his tip jar and uh, help uh, supplant his uh, his uh, retirement income there so Ozzy God bless you Ad Astro you're going to be missed and uh, talking to uh, uh, the powers that be here, Karen Conklin, at our museum. Yes, we are going to do some sort of memorial to Ozzy, and uh, uh, he will be remembered uh, uh, for as long as this museum is, is standing around and as long as we talk about him on Stay Curious. <clears throat> we'll compose myself here a minute and just... Uh, we're going to have this beautiful couple. We're going to have the, the not the beautiful woman, Donnie, but Gary. I know Donnie will be with him. Uh, they are in Collins, Georgia. That's our Vidalia onion peanut farmer. And Gary Gerald has been one of the, the staunch supporters of Stay Curious for uh, since our beginning in March 2020, born out of the pandemic. And uh, we being Marty Winkle and our whole staff here. Marty, we're looking forward to Gary who is uh, not known for public speaking, let me put it that way. Uh, he's kind of like you, Marty, uh, you know, <laughs> likes to, to be in the background, but once we get you talking, we get you talking. Gary has, has amazed me with how farming is being done right now. GPS, global positioning systems, satellites are helping control farm machinery and make efficient yields and, Gary, and, and just get the most out of their acreage. Gary's going to tell us all about this space age farming tomorrow. So you're going to not uh, want to miss that because if you're like me, you know nothing about it and you're going to learn a lot about it. I know something about it. I dated a bunch of farm girls in Hancock County, Ohio, up there in Finley, which we had about 40,000 people in Finley, Ohio, and about 40,000 in the county. Uh, such uh, uh, wheat, soybeans, uh, and corn fields that get as high as an elephant's eye in july so gary gerald i know you're watching we look forward to seeing you in here as well as your wife donnie and hope you're enjoying your vacation here on the space coast well this is a friend of mine matt harbison an outside an outstanding photographer uh, up in uh, chattanooga tennessee the perseid meteor shower is this saturday night sunday morning it's the debris of the comet Swift Tuttle. And we'll talk about that now. <clears throat> Every July and August. Uh, no, we're not going to talk about that now. I'm out. I was going to talk about the every July and August, the debris from this uh, comet we plow into it. But I just want to take you in my backyard with a little backyard astronomy. And there's my backyard looking up at directly south. So find where south is in your your backyard and look in that direction tonight the moon is out of the way that's why these meteors are going to be so great this weekend because the meteors uh there's not going to be any moonshine to uh blot out the fainter meteors so you're going to see meteors down to uh you know almost the limit of human eye seeing wherever you're at which is six magnitude so i'm looking out in the daytime into the south and this is what I'm really looking at. There's some clouds there. This is maybe a 30-second exposure on a tripod at maybe a 1,000 ISO, sent to sensitivity. But Scorpio, the fish hook is there. See it there? Marty, that is a fish hook shape of Scorpio the scorpion as I go back and forth. And these stars are in the light-polluted skies of Cocoa, Florida. All right. And then... There's another fish hook look of Scorpio off, uh, in a darker site that you can now see the stars form in the fish hook there. 
And there is a Milky Way shot with uh, the red star is Aldebaran. Uh, I mean, it's Antares, okay? Meaning not... Uh, and there is a plane that went through here. Well, I took a picture of the Milky Way, just uh, disturbing my picture. So, again, a few uh, another shot of my backyard looking directly south, framed by trees. In this case, a palm tree and a pine tree there. And uh, a few hours after Scorpio, like an hour later, Scorpio is to the right, and in the middle here is the center of our galaxy in the Milky Way in the form of a teapot, Sagittarius the teapot. Hard to see there, but when I show you the outline, Sagittarius is a hunter with a bow and arrow, but actually the stars look more like an asterism of a teapot. And the steam coming above the spout is the Milky Way. And there is another shot of it that I'm going to show you there's the teapot. And all of these objects there that I'm pointing out are 10,000 10, light years away up there. M22, for example. In the lower right, M7 right there. We're going to see these stars are 800 light years away. It's a, and, and so on and so forth. Note the top, the Triffid Nebula and the Lagoon Nebula. We're going to see those through a backyard telescope. And see the center of our galaxy there? That is right above the spout of Sagittarius, or the or the the, the uh, um, teapot. Now M twenty two up there at the top of the teapot, uh, ten thousand light years away in a telescope looks like a faint fuzzy beehive of stars, and in a photography uh, good picture it is a globular cluster, exactly that, thousands and thousands of stars. And this is another, this is that group of stars off to the right, called the uh, M7, the cluster of stars there. That, uh, And then at the very top, Triffid and Lagoon Nebula. Triffid means three parts. This is the beautiful shot from my friend Mark Poole in India Atlantic, Marty. The light polluted backyard in his own backyard. He didn't jump in a starship and, and go take this picture. No, he took this from his light polluted skies, which astronomers, amateur astronomers can do that now, uh, given the right equipment and a lot of patience. This is more like uh, 30 uh, two-minute exposures stacked on top of each other. But that's the Triffid Nebula in the upper right, three parts. You can just barely see it with your naked eye. In the Lagoon Nebula, you can definitely see in this photo, which represents the naked eye. Looking south, you uh, if you're up north, look towards Florida. If you're in Florida, look towards Miami and Cuba, okay? And you're going to see a spectacular Milky Way this weekend. And if you just have a tripod and any camera, any digital camera, increase the sensitivity called ISO, touch that button and put it up to 5,000 if it goes that high, all right? Uh, and then put it on manual, 30 second exposure, and uh, you want the f-stop to be wide open, a low number on the f-stop. If you put a 30 second exposure on the shutter, it might adjust the, uh, the uh, uh, aperture for something like f22 and then you wouldn't get a good picture you want a lot of light hitting that so uh, manual exposure and or put it in night mode if it has that take a 30 second exposure you're going to get something like that and it'll blow your mind what we're looking at is our galaxy which if we could see it from up above on the left you see where the sun is we actually have a bar through the middle and these arms we're looking at one of the arms is the milky way there on this and there's the edge on view of it and there i am out at the texas star party about seven years ago and that is a place to at the great bend national uh park to get some really really dark skies and without a doubt marty that's the best uh milky way shot i've ever taken and uh but this is what it looks like maybe from your subdivision okay you can barely see the teapot of the uh, Sagittarius 
in the Milky Way goes up and down where I got the word Milky Way, but you cannot see it from uh, my Tennessee uh, neighborhood there when I lived up there. But that's how you see it without light pollution as it's setting. Uh, Marty, is, what popped into my mind is during Hurricane uh, Irma uh, four years ago, the lights were out in Orlando for three days and people were calling the fire department saying they were seeing a, 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 a smoke uh, on the southern horizon because this was in September. And what they were seeing when the police investigated this smoke that people were calling in a fire in the south, it was the Milky Way. People never seen it before, particularly urban dwellers in downtown Orlando where the lights were out for three days. Well, now let's get to the light show, shooting stars. Ancients didn't know what these were. There is another time exposure photograph where somebody took maybe 20 different pictures. They could have even photoshopped all that in, but it just looks pretty. And you see the Milky Way kind of rising in the background there as you always want to have a human perspective to your photos. It always adds so much to them. And uh, uh, particularly getting somebody in the foreground that you can uh, uh, maybe silhouette or something like that. Uh, so the annual Perseid meteor shower is going to peak uh, this weekend. And uh, like I said, it emanates out of the constellation Perseus, which rises about two in the morning. All right. So, but uh, imagine this. See the Perseid radiant there, Marty? Well, if you've been in a rainstorm at night with your headlights on, or a snowstorm, more appropriately, at night with your headlights on, it looks like all the rain or the snow is coming from right up ahead of you at a point, emanating, and then it flies by you, okay? That is an optical illusion by us motion into the storm, though things are raining, falling down, straight down. When you put movement into it, it's like, it's a vector or a radiant coming at you as it hits you. So we are going through a, a debris field left by the comet Swift Total. Swift Total is a well-known established uh, uh, comet that its orbit is 133 years to go from the same point and back to it. And it'll be close to Earth again in uh, 2195 all right it just had a close apparition and uh so it's not going to be uh it last whizzed by earth in 1992. it's big 16 mile nucleus halley's comet's only about seven miles uh big the actual comet so it's shedding a lot of debris and and it goes way out past the or uh the orbit of uh, neptune and then arcs around and comes back in uh, every 133 years pulled in by the sun. So in every August, we go through this path in our orbit. All right. It's like going over a bridge uh, in the summertime, maybe a small little creek bridge that I'm familiar with growing up in rural Ohio. And uh, as you're going down the road, you don't see any bugs, but you go over a little bridge where there's water and, and gnats and mosquitoes and everything living around there. Maybe a few uh, uh, damselflies are, are there and bees maybe. And when you go over that little bridge, splat, your windshield just sort of gets covered with a bunch of hits from insects and stuff around that water going over the bridge. And that is what it's like to go into a meteor shower. All right. So. Uh, we know that when you have those love bugs around here. And boy, the, we haven't had the, the bugs this year, but sometimes they get these bugs and man, they're horrible. Uh, you got to hose them off your windshield. Windshield wipers won't even work. So that's what we're going through throughout history. We didn't know what these were, but they were so timely and predictable that people become known to, uh, to become familiar with them. Thus the annual Perseid meteor shower that a lot of people know in August from camping out. Now, there's actually a better yielding meteor shower in December, the Geminids, but that's two weeks before December 25th. All right, it's around December 11th and 12th. 
Well, that time so close to Christmas and the holidays, people are so busy and it's usually cold in North America and Europe. So people aren't out under the sky like they are going to be this weekend. Me included, losing some sleep. Because uh, this could be a really good one. Uh, the moon is uh, 26 days old. So what phase is the moon there? If I say the moon's 26 days old, we've talked about a 28-day cycle of the moon to talk like an amateur astronomer. And if I say that the moon is, uh, if zero is new moon, and I say the moon's 26 days old, yeah, it's about two days before new moon. So it's a thin crescent. The moonlight's not going to interfere one bit with any of those faint meteors, so you're going to see lots of them. The key is finding a dark place, getting comfortable, and letting your eyes adjust, adjust to the dark, okay? And don't let any white light hit your eyes. So white light will make your pupil uh, 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 contract again after it dilates like the optometrist does the look in your eye gives you those drops your eyes become as big as cat cat size there and that's to let in a lot of light and uh if you could do that when you're stargazing you see uh, instantly but it will dilate out naturally in 10 or 15 minutes then you use red flashlights red cellophane on light because red light does not make does not make your eyes uh, contract again so get your eyes good and adjusted to the night and then don't let them look at any white light uh, of course these aren't falling stars but pieces of debris in space that the earth plows through we plow through every day all right 10 tons of debris that's right 20,000 pounds of dust lands on the earth from meteors and comets every day some of it we see burning up with the Earth's 70% ocean, of course, we're not going to see many of the places there. So, well, let's explain a little bit about three terms that you need to know when you're talking about meteor, meteorites, or meteoroids, all right? Jamie Orange, thank you for watching. And Robert Law is up in Dundee, Scotland. Doug Forrest is watching. Tommy Usiak, talk to you today. And Dave Stangy, thanks for your all of your condolences on our friend, um, Ozzy. So, this debris comes from comets or asteroids. It could even be off of a planet. Uh, when a big asteroid hits a planet, debris can be ejected into space. That's how we get a moon and Mars meteorites. All right. Well, a meteorite is when it's on the Earth or Mars or the ground. All right. That is a meteorite. You're picking it up. A meteor is when it's streaking through the atmosphere. We've seen meteorites on Mars, okay? So you just can't say meteorites are when they streak through Earth's atmosphere. No, we've seen them on Mars also. How have we seen them? By our rovers taking pictures, long exposure photos of the sky at night. Yeah, we've done that a lot. And then a meteoroid is a space debris free-floating in outer space. All right, interplanetary, if you will. Usually these objects are traveling 20,000 miles an hour when they hit an atmosphere. And for a brief second, energy is exchanged. Mass is turned into energy called light. And we see a streaking light. So if you see it last beyond one or two seconds, you know it's a bigger rock. Most meteors uh, we see in the atmosphere are the size of a grain of sand or salt. But because that has a lot of energy, when it hits the friction, you see the it light up. Um, there's another chart about meteor terminology from the American Meteor Society, which is such a thing for over 50 years, probably over almost 100 years. And that's where you would report things uh, if you see something big explode. And you see these... Uh, Bigger meteoroids, when they become meteorites and hit the atmosphere, or become meteors and hit the atmosphere, uh, they can blow up and explode. And those are called bolides. And there is such one hitting the atmosphere. They're beautiful to see. Once in a while, there can be noise associated with them. But typically, a meteoroid like this one beside me 
uh, would be a, maybe 50 miles away. But there's ways to track these things and to have them um, uh, charted, and that's what the uh, American Meteor Society does. Well, here's what we call a beautiful radiant, okay, that you can trace back to a point in the center left there where all of these meteors originated from. Isn't that beautiful? And uh, astrophotographers have a beautiful way of displaying that. So as we end here, we're, we're, we're very non-political here at the American Space Museum, but perhaps as we heat up to our uh, another election cycle, you might be wanting to put this <laughs> bumper sticker on your car. And we look forward to space age farming with Gary Gerald tomorrow, Marty. Uh, and there's a beautiful picture of the meteors there as we, again, think of our friend going out, Ozzy Osbourne. Uh, God bless him and his family. And we'll update you about uh, a memorial that is going to be planned. And any way that uh, you might be involved in that, we'll certainly let you know. So, Marty, a great weekend to get out and uh, get some star shine, see some meteors. I guarantee you're going to see a bunch. Uh, the key is to get to a dark, reasonably dark side. If you're stuck in your backyard, all right, pick an area of the sky that you don't see as much light pollution and make sure the neighbor's light's blocked out because they're going to leave their porch light on all night. The most important night of the year you want to get out. They never leave it on, but they're going to leave it on all night to, uh, this weekend. Uh, and if they're good neighbors, go over there and tell them, you know what, maybe you want to come out and see some meteors with me. Uh, that's what I'm going to be doing in case you see my red flashlight. And uh, would you please turn off your light? Uh, so uh, uh, I guarantee you in a quick hour, you're going to see five or ten uh, in there. They seem to always come in sort of, you'll see two or three at a time. Uh, and I miss being on the mountains, Marty, because we would go to Perseid Meteor Night up on, uh, well, Ripshin Ridge is a place where I've seen it, up in Damascus, that's in Johnson City, Tennessee, but uh, area in Unicoi County. Uh, but up in uh, Damascus, Virginia, on White Top Mountain, Marty, we would be laid out on lawn chairs and blankets i'm talking 10 15 of us all looking up at the sky and there'd be a big mountain on the other side a big valley maybe a mile away and when there's a big one that is really bright you can't help but emotionally go oh wow and you'll hear that from people across the other mountain occasionally and then you'll say uh you know hello stargazer and that kind of stuff back and forth and never see their faces but hear their reactions and uh, so uh, the beach is a good place to watch this you'll see some bright ones uh, look in the east direction of course keep your eyes away uh, from the the bright lights and uh, there's a couple big parks around here so go find a park a good time to take your camper out and do some camping uh, but don't stick around the campfire. Get out to where the big meadow is and find yourself some shooting stars this weekend as the Perseid meteor shower will not disappoint. The only thing that will, could disappoint is clouds. So we don't want any clouds. I'm going to go out. There's a Milky Way that I'm going to snack on here. Get out and get you some Milky Way and get you some meteors this weekend, Marty. And we look forward to you, Gary Gerald, tomorrow on Stay Curious. Marty, thanks for a great Streamlabs job there. Thank you all for watching today. And God bless Ad Astra, our good friend Ozzy. I'm going to be uh, catch a falling star, put it in your pocket, never let it fade away. There's a song from Disney days that when I watched it there. But uh, they always say, uh, make a wish on a falling star, and I'll be wishing nothing but good things. For Ozzy and his family, the first shooting star I see this weekend. Until tomorrow, when we're going to talk about farming and how NASA has revolutionized that with satellites, I'm Mark Marquette saying we can't wait to see you again to bridge the space between us.